This episode contains discussion of murder and rape, though it's not graphic. Discretion is advised. Before her death, Virginia said, I'm a jinx. As soon as I love a man, something terrible happens to him. It was a hot day in 1921, September in San Francisco, somewhere after 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Famous people partied together in a hotel suite. Topless women, alcohol, couples dancing to the radio. This was the heady days of early cinema, and one of the most famous actors in Hollywood was among those attending the party. He was heavy and with a baby face. A peer of Charlie Chaplin, Harold Lloyd, and Buster Keaton. At five foot six, he weighed 226 pounds. His name was Roscoe Arbuckle. The actor crossed the hotel room and approached a beautiful woman. He was a Hollywood playboy. She was a fashion designer turned actress engaged to another man a film director who seemed to almost approve of her flirtations with other men. Roscoe took her by the hand and said, loud enough for others to hear, I've waited five years for this and now I've got you. They disappeared into a separate bedroom. The couple was gone for 20 minutes, during which time the party carried on. More dancing, more alcohol, which was illegal at the time, but available if you had the money. The guests became sloppily drunk. They spread out on couches and had a good time, for the most part, until Virginia screamed. The revelers ran to the bedroom door, but it was locked. Virginia yelled again, insisting that Fatty Arbuckle was killing her. That affair set off a domino effect that sparked one of the most publicized court cases of its age. It ruined an actor's career and manipulated our perception of how people were back then. Perhaps the golden age of cinema wasn't so golden. You're listening to the show that uses journalistic tools to look inside the Christian church. We press pause on the culture wars to explore how we got here and how we can do better. I'm Chris Sterren, and this is Truce. The 20s and early 30s were a time of moral struggle. A murder trial involving one of Hollywood's biggest stars certainly didn't help. Consider that day in 1921, the St. Francis Hotel in San Francisco. A Hollywood icon walked into a hotel bedroom with the fiancé of another man. Fatty Arbuckle was so famous that Buster Keaton, one of the greatest stars of the silent era, got second billing when they acted together. The lovers joined hands and left the party. 20 minutes later, everyone heard Virginia Rapp scream. Virginia had needed to use the bathroom before leaving the party. In the course of events inside the bedroom, her bladder ruptured, perhaps due to the force placed on her during the affair. The first doctor on the scene misdiagnosed her condition, told her to rest in her own room. It was just too much alcohol, he said. Except it wasn't. She was dying. Doctors could have stitched up her bladder if they'd gotten her to a hospital immediately, but that didn't happen. They carried her to another room and left her there. What turned out to be a fatal mistake. Virginia endured four days of excruciating pain, and she told a nurse that Arbuckle had raped her. That all sounds like a tidy narrative. We might be tempted in this era to think that this is a Harvey Weinstein-style incident. A powerful Hollywood man taking advantage of a woman struggling to make it in the biz. But that just isn't the case. There were two mistrials. The third jury found Arbuckle not guilty and even apologized to him. We might say that's because he was famous rich and at the top of his game, a white man who took what he wanted regardless of the consequences. But I would caution you to resist that temptation, because you see, it had all been a setup. There was a woman at the party by the name of Maude Delmont. Her nickname was Madame Black. 
prosecutors had hoped that her testimony would put Arbuckle behind bars until they looked into her history. It turns out she wasn't the impartial witness they'd hoped for. Delmont had a side hustle, a dark, ugly little business. She was the go-to person if you wanted beautiful women at your Hollywood parties. But it didn't stop there. The women were brought to the parties to seduce rich and famous men, get them into bed, and make a show of it. Then came the blackmail. Once the men took the bait, Maud stepped in and claimed that the women had been raped. Either they paid Maud Delmont, or she'd leaked the story to the press. We know this because the prosecutors found telegrams sent three days before the fateful party. Telegrams written by Maud Delmont. They were addressed to lawyers in San Diego and Los Angeles. She wrote in that clunky telegram way, We have Roscoe Arbuckle in a hole here. Chance to make some money out of him. It had been a setup. One that cost Virginia her life. Not because Roscoe had beaten her as some people suspected, but because of Virginia's faulty bladder. An issue which was probably exacerbated by a drinking problem. Arbuckle, it turns out, hadn't killed her. But that didn't change the public opinion of Roscoe. During the trial, theater owners banned his films. Fan mail turned to hate mail. Americans were scandalized by the poor behavior of Hollywood celebrities. And it wasn't just the murder. The partygoers had broken prohibition laws. Arbuckle was acquitted. He went free. But his career was basically over. And the American public wouldn't stop there. Popular opinion turned against the movie industry, which was bad for business. Other celebrity scandals had also occurred. Paternity suits, public divorces, rape cases. But it was the death of Virginia Rapp that tipped the scales. Hollywood was already concerned that the government would step in and censor their films. They didn't want Washington running the film industry. Movies at the time were not seen as protected by the First Amendment. So the studios decided to censor themselves, beat the government to the punch. They formed the Motion Picture Producers and Distributors Association, the MPPDA. What they needed was someone to run it. Someone who was already influential, someone who the politicians, especially conservative politicians, would like. They chose Will Hayes. Hayes was a small man, only 110 pounds, kind of cartoonish looking, with big ears that stuck out away from his head. They had many reasons to pick this Indiana boy. He'd been the chair of the Republican National Committee from 1918 to 1921. He was also the campaign manager for Warren G. Harding's successful presidential run, which won him a job as the Postmaster General. The guy had connections. Not to mention, it couldn't hurt to put a Presbyterian elder in charge of an organization that oversaw a supposedly Jewish-run industry. Satisfy the haters. Pick someone so conservative, so overtly Christian, that it can divert attention away from the studio heads. Hayes wasn't 100% clean. He'd been behind some malfeasance known as the Teapot Dome scandal. It had a lot to do with payoffs associated with government oil contracts. Hayes was chosen as the man for the job in 1922. At first, the MPPDA promoted the film industry, not really regulating it. That didn't stop public pressure, so they released a list of what they called don'ts and be carefuls in 1927. Some of which you'd expect, like don't show children sex organs and no illegal drugs. Good has to triumph over evil. Others are a little more surprising, like no profanity, including using the Lord's name in vain, no white slavery, and no sexual relationships between white and black races. Also, no men and women in bed together. Think about Lucy and Ricky Ricardo with their separate beds in I Love Lucy. This initial code was not well enforced. It was more symbolic, suggested, which wasn't good enough for some viewers, especially Catholic leaders. So they created a stricter code in 1930. This list was soon termed the Hayes Code after Will Hayes, but there was conflict there. Remember, this was 1930, 
right at the beginning of the Great Depression. People didn't have money for food, let alone entertainment like movies. Customers were not going to see films. This was a terrible time to start cleaning up movies, so they just didn't clean them up. The industry did what they could to attract more viewers by adding nudity and violence, not to mention homosexuality. What would that be, a don't or a be careful? Anyway, let me give you some examples. In the film Morocco from 1930, Marlena Dietrich dressed as a man and kissed a girl in the audience of a cabaret. There were gay characters in films like Our Betters, Sailor's Luck, and Cavalcade, all from 1933. Religious audiences noticed that the moral guidelines of the Hays Code were not being followed. So Catholic leaders formed the Legion of Decency. They put pressure on Catholics, making them pledge not to go see films that the Legion disapproved of. Hollywood was facing a boycott. Their gamble to spice up films to get more eyeballs backfired. In 1934, Catholics demanded that the Hays Code be enforced. Which is why there was a golden age of cinema. Movies like It Happened One Night, It's a Wonderful Life, and The Wizard of Oz. That's not to say that films from this period were all roses and smiles. They made some dark films, too. But they had to be clever about it. Work around the rules. This is the era of film noir, movies like The Maltese Falcon and Double Indemnity, and one of my favorite black and white films, Sunset Boulevard, which, when you think about it, is not all that squeaky clean. It's about this Hollywood writer. We first meet him when he's floating face down in a pool, dead, even though somehow he's also the narrator. That's me. Joe Gillis, the sort of dead narrator. Then we flash back. Joe's a has-been, all washed up, trying to get this film made. It's called Bases Loaded. The trouble is, his car is about to get repossessed. And he can't lose his car because in, in Los, Los Angeles, Angeles that's, that's like, like getting, getting your, your legs, legs cut off. Joe gets in a high-speed car chase. He stashes his car in the garage of a giant old house on Sunset Boulevard. It belongs to Norma Desmond. And now, Mr. DeMille? Um, not yet. Oh, sorry. Norma Desmond, a has-been actress from the silent days of film. She used to be big. I am big. It's the pictures that got small. Which is one of her two catchphrases in the movie. Joe is a poor writer running from the repo man, and Norma is in need of a comeback. It's not a comeback. I hate that word. So the two make a deal. Joe will rework her screenplay and she'll provide for his needs, which leads to an uneasy, uh, romantic relationship? They're clearly sleeping together, but it's all hinted at, thanks to the Hayes Code. At the end, as Joe is leaving Norma, she pulls a gun on him and shoots. Joe stumbles and falls into the pool. There is no blood, none, not even after he's been soaking in the water. At this point, Joe's selfish behavior, using an old woman for her money, is paid back with his life. And Norma, in one of the great scenes in film history, promenades down the stairs as cameras are rolling. She's back in the limelight in front of the cameras, and she says this famous line that is almost always misquoted. Now? Uh, yes, go ahead. All right, Mr. DeMille, I'm ready for my close-up. Think about that film today. We definitely get more than a hint that the two were sleeping together. In the 1950s version, though, there's only subtext and no foul language. I mean, you've seen movies recently. There is no way there wouldn't be some swearing, at least when he's stumbling to his death. But it's clean. Even though the film is about a man using an old woman for her money, you could probably show the movie to a pretty young kid without any issues. That's the palpable difference between films then and now. They had to be creative with their deviance. Will Hayes was the public face at the start of the movement to gussy up Hollywood's image, but the artists weren't going to keep it clean if left to their own devices. The guy tasked with enforcing the code was Joseph Breen. He was a strong Roman Catholic who had some sketchy anti-Semitic ideas. The Breen team 
went through scripts before films were made and made notes of everything they found objectionable. Their seal of approval appears in most of the film credits from that era, which made Joseph Breen the most powerful Hollywood mogul you've probably never heard of. He decided which films made it to distribution and which did not. It wasn't just big business that agreed to censorship. Actors under contract with their studios were often required to live their lives in a wholesome manner, or at least pretend to. Even to the point of Hollywood studios creating fake heterosexual relationships to cover up the lifestyles of their homosexual actors. They hired press agents to ensure that nobody found out how their movie stars really lived. The same was true for baseball players. Babe Ruth needed PR people to cover up his hard lifestyle of alcohol and loose women. In that era, the public illusion of morality was key. Knowing that, some people think that the Maude Delmont blackmail story was created by the studio PR people to protect Fatty Arbuckle. The problem is, there just isn't any evidence of a cover-up. But there is evidence for Maude's blackmail scheme. The Hays Code was in effect until the 1960s. The organization was renamed to the Motion Picture Association of America, or the MPAA. Instead of censoring films, they settled on a rating system. Eventually, over decades, landing on the system we have today with G, PG, PG PG-13R, and NC-17 ratings. Consumers, they realized, could decide what they wanted to watch for themselves. For 30 years, the industry was run by Christians. No, not run. How about ruled, controlled, or bullied by Christians? as part of a PR campaign to subdue Americans who were outraged by indecency in their movies. Flash forward to today and the modern concern about freedom of speech. Think about our last episode where we discussed the pro-life movie Unplanned. Many conservatives are upset by the way that this film has been treated in the media, saying that the MPAA's rating was unfair, that it amounted to censorship, which is quite a swing when you think about it. We Christians went from running the MPAA and censoring films to now protesting the same organization for doing what we used to do. The shoe is now on the other foot, as they say. That is takeaway number one. We humans are two-faced when it comes to censorship. We want our kind of freedom of speech. Takeaway number two is this. Remember that Hollywood is and always has been artifice. Christians today often wax philosophic about the good old days, when people in Hollywood had good morals, when actors led decent lives. They point to films of old as proof that the human condition was better back then. And let me tell you, clearly, no it wasn't. Movies were clean because we forced them to be clean, not because producers, writers, directors, and actors were better people back then, or because They wanted to make clean films. This nostalgia for a bygone era applies to areas beyond the silver screen. We gussy up our collective memories of this whole era. In reality, the supposed golden age of cinema coincided with Americans rounding up Japanese Americans and imprisoning them on our own soil. We enforced Jim Crow laws. We oppressed women. We blacklisted anyone who might be even a little bit communist. We polluted our soil with nuclear waste. We knowingly pushed tobacco even though we knew it caused cancer. We have been, and until the end of time, will be imperfect. That's why we need a savior in the first place. That's why even the greatest generation needed a savior too. We need Jesus just as badly now as they did in the 1930s. Pretending that the media was better back then on its own does no good at all. It only looks good because it was censored. As much as we want to bellyache about being censored ourselves, we can't have it both ways. Special thanks to my friend Andy Pearson for his help researching this story. I've got a long list of sources on our website, including some fascinating videos on the subject. There's also a link to an archive where you can read original documents from the MPPDA. The website is trucepodcast.com. 
Once you're there, you can find our social media links, join our email list, and learn about my films Bringing Up Bobby and Between the Walls and my novel Cradle Robber. Roy Browning designed our website and his company, JMC Brands, is now starting to assist with advertising. My friend John Wilkerson from the Wired Homeschool Podcast is helping me with social media. Our logo was created by Andy Huff. Thanks to Kira Griffith and Gannon Castle for their vocal work. Nick Steering gives me the uncensored feedback I so desperately need. Please consider donating to help us out on Patreon or GoFundMe.com. There are links to those services on our website. And please tell your friends about the show. Thanks for listening. I'm Chris Steering, and this is Truce. I am big. It's the pictures. I am big. It's the pictures that got small. Nice.